Uh, we're here because of the imminent release uh, of a new, uh, a new product, the Sonox Fraunhofer Pro Codec. In the audio industry now, uh, it's impossible to escape from compressed audio. Uh, compressed audio, I don't mean songs that have been uh, squashed, have no dynamics left in them, or, uh, although it's difficult to escape from them as well. No, compressed audio, what we're talking about is perceptually encoded audio that's data compressed for convenience. Uh, so that's smaller file size, lower bit rates, uh, and ease of online distribution. So we're talking about MP3 and AAC audio. Uh, iPods, mobile phones, uh, computers, internet, radio, everything uh, now involves MP3s. Uh, and more and more AEC. Uh, nowadays, I believe even DJs scratch with MP3. Uh, so perceptually encoded compressed audio is every, everywhere, and we, the audio industry, has to produce that audio for people. Now, during the 20-year history of MP3, no one has ever been able to audition these codecs in real time before. That's what this plugin does. So firstly, uh, it's a major time saver for mastering engineers. Uh, the cycle, um, mix, render to MP3, listen. If you don't like it, you have to go back. You have to cycle around, mix, render again, listen again. Still don't like it. Well, this plugin cuts that cycle. Secondly, it gives control and quality assurance back to the engineer. It allows you to analyze the signal. Are there artifacts? If so, can I hear them? Where are they? What can I do about them? And fourthly, it's a problem solver. Under some circumstances, it'll show you a problem that actually you probably never even knew that you had. And then, of <coughs> course, it gives you the tools to remedy that problem. So let me introduce um, Dr. Grill. Yeah, thanks again for the... Nice introduction. MP3 is a strange product, really, so uh, nobody wanted that, at least not nobody in the industry, really. So it was definitely not welcomed by the music industry. The equipment manufacturers, the consumer electronic industry didn't like it either, right? So they thought it's some crazy product of some strange university heads, and what is it good for? They only started to build products uh, after people started to buy uh, products from previously totally unknown companies. So. Consumer electronic industry in the meantime, I think, has accepted that MP3 is a good idea. So it's in virtually every phone nowadays and in many more products, uh, almost everything you can just think about uh, from things you can wear, uh, things you can wash and whatever. So you can find uh, MP3 products in nearly everywhere. So it's uh, in general now welcomed by the consumer electronic industry where it's not so much present uh, for some strange reason is the professional world, really. And uh, I think Sonox is a nice... Uh, cornerstone here and what my job here is now um, really try to really explain why mp3 is not just something that leaves something out and reduces the music to something which is less than before try to convince you the real culprit is not mp3 but your your own human ear um, but let me start with uh, some remarks on, on audio quality so how, how would you define audio quality right so is it is it the uh, Classical parameters, obviously audio bandwidth, uh, everybody understands that, right? So you want 16, maybe a little bit more than that, to up to 20 kilohertz, kilohertz but that's age dependent, right? And uh, there's nobody here in the room, I would assume, who can still hear the 20 kilohertz reliably. But really, you don't need more than that, right? So there are many more things to worry than about uh, extending frequency range up to 40 kilohertz. Um, of course, uh, uh, commercial thing is something different y if you want to write on your box yeah, your, your thing is capable to go up to 90 kilohertz that's fine right and I'm fine with that but uh, there's no real reason to do that um, dynamic range is a, another thing that's obviously also there although as you mentioned before compressed very much dynamic range compressed music is there uh, gets predominant really so uh, something there's almost no dynamic range left but in theory it's a good thing to have dynamic range available 
So, and in theory, you need something like 140 dB. You, you won't need more unless you want to destroy somebody's ears, ears uh, because if you go higher than 140 dB above the defined uh, zero level, so you are probably going to jail if you actually play that to somebody. Yeah? And you see that the ear is very insensitive at lower frequencies. You need a pretty high sound pressure level to have any sensation down here. On the other hand, where the babies cry, it's, it's very sensitive to the ear, so small babies can create a lot of effect, really, with very low sound pressure levels. Then you have the upper bound. Uh, it go, the curve goes up uh, at around 16 kilohertz, really, depending on age. And this dotted line is representing some, some hearing-impaired uh, auditory system. Now we take a model. So we present some sound, which is uh, a mixture of a 400 hertz tone, a 1600 hertz tone, and a 6400 hertz tone, so three tones. What you see here is basically what happens in your inner ear on this membrane. So you see the sound enters basically from this direction into your inner ear. You will see the membrane vibrating. The first interesting thing to notice is that the inner ear works like a filter. You have this uh, mixture of three different tones and you find them at different distances <coughs> from the entrance of the inner ear, right? So it's not like the inner ear would just process sound arbitrarily, but each location on this membrane is responsible for a certain frequency, which also means because it's already displaced at that point, it cannot pick up other sounds, right? In case you have a rather loud tone at 6,000, or let's pick that one, at, at 1,600 hertz, you have a rather loud tone, it will cause this displacement of the membrane really, right? And so your hair cells, which pick up the sound, they are already moving, right, and, and, and doing something. Also, it's some sort of effect that's not coming from some real sound, but it's caused by this one tone, which is located at 1,600 hertz. But it distorts the neighboring hair cells in a way, in, in, in a pretty brutal way, really. So in other words, if you have a loud tone at a certain frequency, the neighboring regions are blocked from hearing, really, because they are already busy coping with the effects of uh, the one tone, right? And uh, if you take uh, now listening tests where you try to measure these masking curves, then you end up with something with which is very similar to the curves you see on the, on the membrane, actually, right? So in other words, when you start to measure how much sound pressure level is, is required, if you have a tone at a certain frequency, and how much is required at a neighboring frequency to be audible, you end up with curves that are very similar to what you see on your membrane. And what I want to prove is that lengthy speech is really, this is nothing you could ever learn to pick up, right? So what, what MP3 pot potentially takes away, right, is, is, is in an area where your physical system is uh, simply not capable to pick it up. You cannot learn that. It's not like uh, your brain would be able to train for that. That's just uh, the mechanism, the, the, the basic ballistics and, 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 and the values of, 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 your, of your inner ear, the way it's constructed really so. So this is nothing you could ever train for. You would need a uh, different ear. As I explained before, this bathtub curve, right? And that changes now if you present some, some, some sort of tone or that's maybe a small band noise signal at a certain frequency, then you see the level that's required for an auditory sensation is increasing really. So it's, uh, for example, you have a, a small, a narrow band uh, tone somewhere at uh, 250 hertz here. And you see uh, it has some effect on the neighboring frequencies. And so a, a large area starts to exist where you can't, can't hear anything really. So it's simply inaccessible. And that's <coughs> the clever trick uh, behind MP3 and the like. How does it really work? I think uh, I, I call it a little bit provoking here, intelligent audio representation. It's a combination of psychoacoustic know-how, so these curves, right? How to exploit these curves, really. And the second thing is, of course, also redundancy removal. There's a lot of talk about uh, lossless coding and so on. MP3 has lossless coding in there for 20 years. If there is redundancy in the signal, there's a quite efficient mechanism to remove that redundancy. Redundancy means something you can take out because it's really redundant. So you don't need it. Uh, it, it you can remove it uh, and you, you don't lose anything by doing that. Uh, fortunately, those signals, tones, they have a lot of redundancy. So the, 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 the lossless coder in MP3 or an AEC can pick up a lot. And that's the basic principle and why it works. And the consumers have been happy so far. And the, the only ones still complaining is the music industry and the professionals because they think we are taking something away from, from their valuable work. But maybe with the help of Sonox, we can change that in the future. 
that fear. So thanks for listening and uh,